dynamic panels that we've ever had here for you today. We're gonna to have a very full panel. We're gonna, right after Tifa's message, we're gonna jump right into that. You ready to get started? All right, let's go. So, if you can, if you can put up the Pledge of Allegiance if you can find it. Okay. And Don, thank you. We want to honor our veterans. Thank you for your service, and we want to honor our country. Okay, Don. Let's play to this message. While they're getting that started, who's here specifically for the dementia topic? I came here just because you want to hear about this topic. Very good. And how many come just because you love to come to seminar series? Hi, it's Deepa Snow, and I've been with Empowered Time. It's deep. It is going to be. We have a professional back there running it, so. <laughs> and I'm not kidding, he's the director of the show, and he's awesome. Hi, it's Deepa Snow, and I've been with Empower Seniors for the last few days, doing work to create this mini-series with Catherine. What a pleasure, wow. And I wish I were with you. Uh, but I'm not. So I thought I would just say a few things to you or talk with you for a second when it comes to dementia, because that's your topic for today. And what I'm going to say is when one person is living with dementia, everyone around them is going to be living with it as well. There's almost always one person who pops up and is going to be that support person. But if you're not careful, <laughs> this relationship can start to pinch. So very quickly and early, I want you to think about if you're this person, look around and find a third party to support you and to be a friend to the person living with dementia. So that, like that, this relationship is going to be more skillful. And it turns out that's really vital. But down the road, you're going to need more people involved. And you know what? It would be great if they all had some awareness and knowledge, and maybe even a little skill when it comes to this thing called dementia. Because frankly, we don't know when the next time we look in the mirror at ourselves, we might notice maybe it's me. And I want the power to make a difference in my own life. And that means I want to involve everyone. So I hope you take this opportunity when you're with others and have experts to ask questions, to learn more, to become aware, to gain knowledge, and most important, build skill. Because you never know when you're going to need it. Awesome. That woman's had me crying all week. She got me to sing on camera. Do I sing, Mom? No. No. Um, and a lot of the medical people in here know who she is, and it's been so delightful to get to know who she is. We've all been learning so much. Last night, she was doing a virtual tour uh, for people in Australia, and she's high in demand. Do you know why we got her down here? COVID. Because she had slowed her schedule down because of COVID. She had an opening. We started talking to her several months ago. We're only the second outside her home appointment she's even taken since since March, since March of 2020. So it's really such an honor. And some of the medical people in this room helped helped me get connected with her. And they are going to be on the panel. Let's have the whole panel come on up. We're going to let them introduce the, themselves. But first of all. The ladies from Catholic Charities, Dr. Robin Heimer, Robert Miller, Fiona Harper, 
Jesus connect me to Tiba to begin with. And Fiona and Robert are helping as production uh, coordinators on this dimension mini series. Couldn't do it without you guys. Okay. So, Robert Miller, Fiona, that's Leanne Miller, Wendy Flick, Diana Tucker Jones. Okay. Very good. All right. So, we're just going to pass the mic. And um, do we have any wet wipes? We might have grabbed those. So we're going to share. Just took a touch your face. <laughs> <laughs> and we're modeling perfect behavior. Good morning. My name is Wendy Blake. I'm executive director of Capital Charities. Um, we have 13 programs under the Capital Charities umbrella, but today I'm here to share information with you about our Adult Day Services program. It is a program that we have been operating since 1975, and we provide day services. The program's open from 7.30 in the morning until 3.30 in the afternoon um, for individuals with uh, early on-stage um, dementia, Alzheimer's, or just seniors who are lonely and home by themselves during the day and want to get out and make new friends and participate in activities. Uh, and we're very excited. Uh, this past April, we opened a new facility to host our Adult Day Services program. It's located at 2235 West 37th Street North, right at the junction of K96 and 235 North. And we have lots of availability to have um, new friends come join us. Um, Leanne Miller here to my left, and I'll pass the microphone to her and she can introduce herself uh, and talk a little bit about her work, but she is the point of contact for anybody interested in joining the program or learning more about the program. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us. Um, as Wendy said, I'm Leanne Miller. I'm the Senior Director of Development for Catholic Charities. Um, back in April, Wendy asked me to assume uh, a new role in working with our adult day services um, community. And I've been meeting and experiencing all of the wonderful families who are interested in day services. And so I am, as she said, your point of contact if you're interested in the tour to learn more about the program, our admissions process, and how you can actually learn more about us. So give me a call. I will be back in the back room, uh, back of the room um, after we get done. And I'd be happy to visit with any one of you to um, schedule those tours and get you on campus. It's an amazing um, facility that we're able, we're very, very proud of and um, unique to this community. So thank you so much. Good morning. I'm Dr. Robin Heinrichs. I'm a board certified neuropsychologist. So I am the specialist that the neurologist or your family doctor or any other physician will refer uh, an individual to, to diagnose the dementia. <clears throat> So, excuse me, I've got a cold in five now. Um, so, my job is to meet with the individual who's noticing some changes and their family, do some testing, find out about their background, and then figure out what's going on. Is it normal aging? Is it Alzheimer's? Is it frontotemporal? And then talk about where we go from here. So, I do the diagnosis, and then I refer to all of these lovely programs that are in the community. Good morning. So if Tipa was here, she would say hi to introduce herself to someone new and then put her hand out and introduce herself. So I'm Robert Miller. I'm a licensed uh, medical social worker. I've been in practice for about 20 years and I've done it all. I've done hospital case management. I've done home health and hospice. And for the last 11 years, I've had the honor of working for a family-owned business called Comfort Care Homes. We also operate Comfort Keepers, which is a private beauty company. So I'm here to represent the plan B. When it starts to get too challenging at home and we've gone and done everything that this panel tells you are good things to prepare for that home uh, care that you're providing with someone with dementia, what's the next step and when is it time? And so I'm here to help you understand that. We represent uh, nine different homes in Wichita, two in Newton, and they are real homes. It's called a Home Plus. Kansas is, one, is the only state that we are aware of in the union that has a set of regulations specific to taking a real single family home and turning it into a care home. And the company I work for started that 27 years ago. 
And wanted to say that we really appreciate Robert because uh, TIPA has done a lot of taping at Comfort Care Homes and interacting with their residents. And it has been really eye opening. And when the PBS series does air, you'll get to see that. And it's really great. So I am Fiona Harper. Hello. And I am a co founder of Changing Minds. It's a dementia care education company. What we do is help the person living with dementia or the care partner of the person living with dementia. We help you to navigate the best life for both of you or all of you, hopefully, throughout the dementia care journey. And we have a particular mission to talk with families because we feel like families are pretty underserved. You can go online and find out some information, but sometimes it's nice to have somebody in the home that will answer your questions particularly, especially those difficult questions. Why is this happening? Um, is this behavior really that inappropriate or why is it occurring related to what's going on with brain change? We can also do things like when you have a urinary tract infection um, and you have a decline in mental status, even though somebody has dementia, sometimes it gets worse at that point. So we can come in as a consult also and help you out with those kinds of situations. So again, I'm from Changing Minds and I am so honored to be here. Uh, good morning. My name is Brianna Tucker, and I'm excited also to be here um, with everyone here on the panel. Um, I am also a licensed social worker. I work for the Alzheimer's Association, and we are a worldwide organization providing care, support, and research. Um, and I work for the Central and Western Kansas chapter, and we service uh, 69 different counties here in Kansas. And we help provide um, information and referrals for families. So if you ever have any questions about the disease process itself, about resources in your community. Um, also, we'll talk through today, uh, when is it time? We can also help talk through that with you as well. Um, we also provide support groups and education um, throughout the disease process. And we also um, not only help with Alzheimer's disease, but all different dementias as well. So, so very excited to be here and talk to each and every one of you. And I'm a realtor. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes I look around and like, yes, you guys at Comfort Homes, so we're filming and I'm surrounded by everyone they hope to test me again, <laughs> just like they did the day before. And I'm like, what is a real estate agent doing here? But obviously it's my passion. I was a little candy striper in seventh eighth grade. I'd get out of grade school, walk over to the nursing home and visit. And that made a big impact on me. My husband, Randy and I, and he's moving all the chairs around. My husband, Randy and I, has realtors. We help seniors with complex housing decisions. And uh, we have all the support that people need. Uh, to stay in their home safely or to make a transitional move. We help with um, move management, full move management, we sort, pack, move people, unpack them, resettle them in, liquidate all the personal property to uh, the family's instructions. And so that's what we do. And we started to see that we just needed to know a lot more about all of these topics. And it's just fascinating to me anyway. And um, so I'm just really honored uh, to uh, have you all here participating. And um, I'm just learning right along with all of you. So let's get started on our questions. One thing I want to point out is that Tifa was very clear in the video about something specific. Can you think of the word she kept saying? She said this vile, something was vile. She said it's vital to become skillful. And that when you're working with helpers, with professionals, at some point that you want to make sure that they're skillful, and that they have skills. And I have a feeling she has some very specific skills in mind. So who would like to, to say something about that? And we'll probably demonstrate some things as we go later. So our company is TIPA so trained. We were actually trained by TIPA in training and consulting 
and I have the GEMS activity specialist, and Catherine will be talking about GEMS here in a bit. But some of the skills that we talk about are things actually that you do every day. But looking at utilizing visual regard as something that is very, very important and having the skill to approach somebody in a positive way and in a way that with brain change, they are comfortable. If you have comfort from them, you will be able to do with, not to them. And that's really important. The other skill, and it truly is a skill, and one of the things that actually you have an advantage of, because all of you out here are social experts, you have been very social all of your lives, and you know how to engage with people, so you have that advantage. But thinking about a conversation that you're going to have with that person, particularly a difficult conversation, such as, we're taking your keys, you can't drive right? What a conversation. Those kinds of things are going to involve a lot of skill and a lot of pre-planning and a lot of relationship skill. But as I said, you guys are experts in skill socially. So those are some of the skills that Tiva talks about. Um, and Robert probably would be able to add a little bit. Do you want to add a little sure. bit on that? I think we have to remember um, the skills that they teach us as professionals, but also those skills are really very applicable to family members. This isn't complex stuff that you can't learn. And it's not about treating anyone as if they're a child either. It's about making sure that we understand where they are at cognitively and that we are relating and adjusting to their world, not ours. And Tifa speaks a lot about that, about when, when you're really kind of enforcing your agenda because you're the one that knows what's going on and you're trying to get that done, you're trying to get them help, you're trying to get them clean, you're trying to get them in the shower, but that's not their agenda. All you're gonna do is pick a fight with someone who does now not understand what you're trying to do. How many of you people in this room are currently taking care of or making decisions for someone with dementia? Does it make sense what I just said about the moments where you're like, I don't understand why she's so upset. Does that make sense? Those moments that happen, we really have to, in our world, in my world, we train our staff towards the idea that you have to be more adaptable than the person in front of you. Should we demonstrate the gender? Sure, you tell me what you, Absolutely. tell me what you Okay, <clears throat> so Robert is living with dementia. Okay. I'm not near as good at role playing as T is. No, so. this is, this is the, oh, okay. Okay. So Robert is somebody living with dementia. And I'm going to be his care partner. All right. Well, he will look at me and think I'm just a little piss ant, won't he? <laughs> I'm little. Um, I'm not very intimidating. Okay. Who am I to tell him what to do? But today I need Robert to take a shower. Or I need Robert to take his medicine today, okay? <laughs> I want everybody to hold up your hand. And I want you to look at your hand. Now you're me, and this is your agenda today, all right? I have to give him a shower. I have to get him to take his medicine, okay? So what I do typically is I take my agenda, right? And if you feel comfortable, put it in your neighbor's face. <laughs> it is. All right. What's Robert going to do? He has a different agenda. Now, when he pushes against me, Robert, you can't drive. You cannot use the Robert. You cannot. You cannot drive, Robert. 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 That's how it goes. Right? Pushing my agenda. Now, if I were to say to Robert, Robert. I want you to come take a ride with me today, right? And he'll say, yeah, okay. You want to drive? Well, I'd prefer to drive. I mean, right. That's what you're going to get. But if I ask him to take a ride with me and he'll say, well, I want to drive. You know what? You're so good. And he talked about this yesterday. You are so good, Robert, about knowing this, this city. And I am getting a little confused with all the construction that's going on. Would you mind being my co-pilot while I drive? Because I'm afraid I'm going to get turned around a little bit. 
Is that a whole different conversation? Yeah. So I had to pre-think that though. Actually, I didn't because Tifa thought it was for me. But I have to think that conversation through before I approach Robert, because Robert's been driving since he was probably 12, mm -hmm. right? And we're meeting in the middle, okay? I'm not pushing my agenda on him. If he says, no, I'm gonna drive because I've seen you drive, I'm gonna have to have a different approach from there, aren't I? So those conversations are ongoing. I have to remember the relationship. I have to remember who Robert is. He is an individual with his own agenda. And I have to adjust mine to do with him, not to him. Okay. Any questions about that? Hey, you must have done a good job. <laughs> so it sounds like we're just really treating people with respect and being very mature and using some finesse and avoiding drama and keeping things calm. Is that important when it comes to dealing with dementia to keep people calm? Robin, would you like to add anything? Sure. One of the things to think about is putting yourself in their shoes. This is somebody you've known and loved for a long time and they, they may still be very bright, but maybe they're forgetting, maybe they're having trouble carrying out tasks and they become frustrated. Well, we all know that if I'm frustrated dealing with someone, that other person is more likely to just get more and more upset. So the calmer we can be, the better. And that's not an easy ask, especially when we're dealing with this every day all day. So I like the point that Tifa also made that you as a caregiver, need to find another person. You need somebody who you can talk with day to day about the frustrations and the, all of those things that are hard to get through. Because think of it this way. I have people say, yes, but I've got to be there for my husband. Yes, but if you go down, he goes down with you. So it's important to have others that are there support, to support you as well. What about people that need a little more physical assistance? Fiona, could you demonstrate how has a very petite person, how you can maybe assist Robert without hurting yourself yes. and without hurting Robert? We're gonna bring this right up to the front. Feel free to stand if you can't see, move around. In fact, we got our seminars here. You look like mature adults. You can get up and do whatever you need to do at any time. somebody to get started doing something okay we call it positive action starter so i'm going to positive physically approach him with the normal greeting that we all should do right that we don't do anymore but we're going to we're going to demonstrate it today and then help him to stand up all right so i'm going to get to the side just a little bit i'm going to have a really non-confrontational stance i know that's funny with me but i'm going to just have one leg forward one leg back, I'm going to be relaxed. And I'm going to approach Robert. I'm going to say, Hi, Robert, it's Fiona. Hi. How are you doing today? Doing good. Doing good? Yeah. If he extends his hand, I'm going to take it. If he doesn't, am I going to take it? I am not. He's not ready. He hasn't visually regarded me yet. He hasn't judged, uh, sized me up and seen what I'm going to do. But he takes it, so I'm going to do that. And it happens. And I'm going to go hand under hand, okay, just like this, kind of like a butterfly. Hand under hand. I'm going to step to the side and I'm going to support him right here. All right. 
And then I'm going to say, let's stand up. Okay. All right. You've got your feet in. Are you ready? I'm ready. One, two, three. How are you feeling? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. <laughs> The dining room is that way. Let's go that way. Okay. And I'm going to walk with him. Okay. So he does not want to stand up. We're going to talk. We're just going to talk for a while. I'm going to let him be more comfortable with me. Okay. Standing to the side rather than, come on, Robert. Come on. Come on. Let's go. All right, because he's muscular in his toes at this point. If he's had a little trouble walking, chances are he's lost school in his toes. Therefore, his toe grab is not there. And so I'm asking him to go like this if I'm in front of him. So off to the side is more supportive. Again, hand under hand. And one, two. And let's go that way. Now, one of the reasons that I approached Robert the way I did, because if he's in, I'm sorry, if he's in moderate stage dementia, he's got binocular or monocular vision. So I want everybody to do this. Binocular. Pay attention, look around, look around the room and just see the change from normal to binocular vision. Most of us are, and I'll ask Dr. Heinrich about this. Would you say most people are diagnosed in the moderate stage? So most of us are diagnosed. We're already in moderate stage. We're already in binocular stage, okay? Because we're smart. We might have dementia, but we're not stupid, right? We can hide some things. Now, Robert might actually be in monocular stage. So close one eye, put the monocle around the other, now look around. Okay. So if I go ahead and stand back in front of if I'm the person living with dementia and I'm sitting down, here comes big old Robert. We don't have to talk. Let's go. That's what happens. Right? And then he's just going to lift me up out of the chair and we're going to go. <laughs> right? But it's scary because he approached me. He didn't give me time for my brain to register who he is, what he intends, um, you know, me to give myself a chance to introduce himself. So when we greet somebody, generally what we do is, hi, I'm Fiona, and your name is, right? Remember when you used to call people on the phone and say, hey, mom. It's Fiona. We don't do that anymore. Hey, mom, which one am I? <laughs> it's a quiz right off the bat, right? She's not up for it. Let me tell you about my mom. So introduce yourself just like you normally, you guys always would. You guys have great, you guys have better social skills than we do nowadays on the phone, right? So that would be my answer. All right, Fiona, vision is so important. So Tell us about kind of normal aging vision and then take us through the whole steps. Yeah. We're going to do it first. Of course, I have to do this. This is a good opportunity to stand if you'd like yeah. to stand. Yeah. So, this is going to help you learn. This is normal vision for a 20 year old. Don't whack your partner, but just put it out there. Thank you. Yes. If you're 20, you can see your fingers move, evidently. Because I can't see them. Look straight at us. I have no idea. All right. They're out there doing something. I have no idea what they're doing. All right. So let's talk about 75 years old. You bring it in about 40 degrees. Normal. This is normal. Okay. Now I'm 56. And if my rooster Gimpy is outside my door when I walk out, I'm already tripping. Okay, I can't see him down there. He's not there because my vision isn't down there. That's why we have the trips and the falls and those kinds of things. We just have to be aware that that's normal. When we are talking about moderate stage dementia, where most of us are diagnosed for Dr. Heinrich, bring it in another 40 degrees, make a circle. 
this is the visual field of somebody just diagnosed with dementia. Okay. Or let's say you're going through depression, anxiety, where your amygdala is having a little bit of problem. That's your fight, flight, fright. Okay. So right here. And then if you have later stages of dementia, right here, that's it, folks. And that's what you have to engage in right there. So folks maybe that are in a wheelchair, uh, wheelchair bound because of, uh, you know, walking changes related to dementia, and you know, it's probably related to dementia. That's probably what you're more talking about. So you have a window of opportunity of that to do the positive physical approach and get their visual regard. Put your monocular on. So if I read Catherine, hi, Catherine. You wrote it. Yeah, there you go. I go hand in her hand. If I'm here, she can. She's going to look at me. Her eyes are going to focus up her hand to mine. It's going to track, and you can watch and do it when you're doing it. And she's going to follow me over here, and here I am. Right. Otherwise, they get distracted. If she gets distracted and starts looking around because somebody plays the music over there, give a little pump of the hand. The chain, there she is again. Why? Because as a baby, you learn eye hand. They lay in the crib, they put the mobile above it, you start trying to whack it, right? Eye hand. It's, it's one of the first things we learn physically, and it's one of the last things to leave us. Actually, vision is the way we take the world. We think the last sense that goes when we pass might be hearing, but hearing doesn't take in all of this. And that's how important it is, all right? As we age, forget about dementia, it's important as we age because we have those changes. So just remember, if you're dealing with somebody in a wheelchair or that you think has some cognitive change, just keep in mind that the vision change uh, might be there. It's just so important for them. And it'll help them connect with you positively. So Fiona, show us again the modern stage vision where most people are diagnosed. Right, so right about there. So we like to call it binocular vision. Okay. Um, if you're if you happen to get lucky and you're diagnosed in, in early stage, it's scuba vision. Scuba vision. Okay. But if you're diagnosed as most people are, it's binocular vision right here. So as you notice, I can't see anything down here. And I can't see anything over here. So if I'm walking across the street, I have to move my entire neck just to see if any cars are coming. And that's why we get so many accidents stepping off the curb or even running in front of somebody, those kinds of things. It's just something that's good to know if you're if you're care partnering with somebody who's living with dementia and they just got diagnosed. So even at this stage where your vision might be like this, an animal, another yeah. car. A stranger or a grandchild can surprise you because it's outside of your field of vision. And that's why, too, you might have more accidents in general or car absolutely. accidents, something jumps in. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons you know, we talk about stepping in and out of like a tub and you have a tub. Um, maybe some of those modifications that you need to at your house to keep in mind those vision changes, a lot of it is actually about that. Um, and so you got to keep those kind of things in mind as you as you age. Normally, that's that's pretty normal. The change in vision is, is normal, and I'm already experiencing it myself. Um, so at 75, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so, all right, thank you. Thanks. All right, so start thinking of your questions because we'll start taking them. Meanwhile, Dr. Henrik, um, tell us what is important about diagnosis because. We know that people will isolate, they might hide things, they might look in the mirror and go, it's me, but they don't really want to talk about it to other people or um, you know, really discuss it. Why is diagnosis important? I think you use the word isolation, which is incredibly important. Uh, this, any type of cognitive decline is isolated because often what's changing is one's ability to interact with others, to adequately assess a situation and figure out what's going on. And imagine how scary that is when before you just figured stuff out automatically, now it doesn't work. 
it is very isolated. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, the tendency is, like you said, to hide it. And if we're bright to start with, we can be really good at hiding. I was at KU School of Medicine for 15 years on their faculty, and I taught medical students and residents and all these very smart doctors in training. And I would tell them that little screener, the many mental status, the three words that your doctors give you, like your primary care doc, you, even if you have Alzheimer's disease, will be able to pass this well into the moderate stage because they're so smart. Okay? Now, if I give them a fuller battery of tests, I can find it. But sometimes that screener is what's being used to identify that. Once a person is diagnosed, now they and family understand what's going on. You can imagine no one likes to hear you have Alzheimer's disease. That's upsetting to hear. However, there's not been one patient or family who has not been appreciative as they leave my office, which is kind of an amazing thing. Because what I'll often hear is, oh, I mean, we kind of knew, but that makes so much more sense. We'll talk about what's different and how to work around that. Um, often the family thinks that the person with impairment is being stubborn and difficult. They're just a pain. They're just so demanding. And in fact, it's changes in their brain that's causing that. Understanding that, understanding the nature of that helps family to, to look at it and not think it's about them, not take it personally. Basically, diagnosis allows the person to be more independent for longer. And that's the goal. We want the person to be as independent as possible while making sure they're safe and others are safe. That's the whole goal for everyone working with individuals, right? Now, I see patients in my office, but I also see them in Via Christi hospitals. Those are the folks who maybe were passing, maybe the kids live out of state and on the phone they sound okay, but now they've fallen and they've broken something. Now they've got a urinary tract infection, so they're very confused. And suddenly we're talking about, okay, what's going on? Do we need to place this person somewhere? Choices therefore have been taken away. So yeah, diagnosis is that first step to get out of isolation and to help family understand what's going on. How many types of dementia are there? So dementia is an umbrella term for the amount of impairment. We can have a little bit of impairment caused by any number of things. And that, you know, we can work around that. And dementia gets diagnosed when it's big enough that it impacts daily life, okay? Now, that doesn't tell us what caused it. Causes of dementia are things like Alzheimer's disease, okay? Gradual change over time, frontotemporal disease, movie body disease. We can also have a head injury, right? I can be in a car crash, hit my head and have a bleed, or I can have a stroke, a blockage that goes from my heart up into my brain. Anything that causes an insult to the brain can potentially cause a dementia. When we hear that term, I think we tend to think of Alzheimer's, right? We think of the degenerative diseases. And those are important because if we know if that's present, if I'm here today, we know that I'm gonna decline later, right? Versus if I had a head injury, I was functioning here before the crash, now I went down rapidly because I, I had a bleed in my brain secondary to that head injury. I gradually get better. Well, I don't ever get worse from that head injury. Well, that's a very different outcome than saying we've got frontotemporal disease and this is what's going to happen. You're gradually going to decline over time. So again, diagnosis allows the individual to have more control over what happens. And it helps the family to be more supportive and understanding. Right. Say the frontal of the temporal, is that separate from the frontal lobe area? So it is named after the frontal lobe and the temporal. Alzheimer's disease attacks the temporal lobe first. Frontotemporal attacks the frontal lobe first. And so those disorders look very different. Alzheimer's, we're used to the forgetting. 
We have the same conversation several times in 30 minutes. You have the person tells you the same story because they've forgotten that they just told it to you. That's Alzheimer's. Frenotemporal is different. Go ahead. Well, we all have talked about <clears throat> excuse me, the person with the, the issue. And I'm kind of thinking, I have, we have someone in our family going through this. I'm, just, I'm thinking, well, it's affecting them because they're trying to make decisions, right. but they have their own lives. One lives in Dallas and one lives in Missouri, and they're trying to take care of their mother who lives in Olathe and trying to get her to understand that a, a, a move is necessary and imminent, but she has to buy into this. And I'm thinking, well, how does the family go about it? Getting uh, a, a diagnosis for the patient, for the mother, or whatever. How do you, who do you contact first? What's their support system? Where does the patient live? Olathe. Olathe. And the daughters live. One lives in Dallas and one lives in uh, Lee Summit. Right. One lives in Lee Summit is close, but she has her own special needs child. She has her own play for it. Don, that is such a common scenario. Absolutely, very, very common. We've had many clients like that. I think that you can reach out to just about anyone that works in the senior care industry and they're going to help get you connected to all of the people. Um, so it, it's just starting somewhere. It's just starting to ask questions. And, um, Felicia with Legacy Legal, you know, sometimes it might start from a conversation with an attorney that specializes in working with seniors, or Cherie uh, with American Senior Benefits, where she helps people with their insurance and their Medicare issues, and it can very often start there, someone that's working with someone all the time and helping them handle all their medical bills and prescriptions and things, and they might notice and they might make a referral. Brian Spear back there in the purple, um, home health and hospice of Kansas. You might start uh, with some in-home care, which is non-medical care. And that just starts communication and supervision. And maybe you get some home health services at some point. And as other things start to show up, as changes are noticed, then referrals can get made. But you can start just about anywhere. And I bet some people start with Catholic Charities. So we ought to with the Alzheimer's Association. How about that? Um, so with the Alzheimer's Association, we're here to walk the journey with you. Um, we have a 24-7 helpline that you can call and ask any questions day or night. Also, you can call myself or our office and we can meet with you in person or over Zoom. So we get these questions a lot. I'm starting to notice these signs. Um, so to echo what Dr. Heinrichs was saying about why it's so important to get this early diagnosis. From a personal experience, um, it's kind of an extreme experience, but it was personal, so I do want to say why it's so important when you start seeing symptoms uh, to talk with the doctor. This was right when I started with the association um, about six years ago. My grandma, um, very nice, and uh, uh, she was the best. Um, so nice, always had everything together, super organized. All of a sudden, she started having a difficult time, very difficult time um, with names, remembering things, and that's kind of part of uh, the Alzheimer's uh, 10 warning signs. I also have brochures back there with more information. Uh, very important to know. So there was some of these signs and there was some more medical signs that we were kind of wondering what was really going on. Um, I don't think if I started with the association, I would have come on. I would have been like, oh, you know, she's, she's in her 80s. And they're a little, maybe we'll just kind of watch her. But we did, we got her to the doctor and they noticed as well. Um, and so they got her a MRI and they noticed there was a brain tumor. Um, so if it wasn't for the education about those 10 warning signs, we wouldn't have caught the brain tumor as early as we do. So that was also why we need, uh, we see these things 
to really talk to your healthcare provider. So what is the question that we get most often is, uh, what do I do? I'm starting to see these signs, who do I talk to? And so we deal with 69 different counties. So a lot of, we don't have a lot of resources in Western Kansas. So typically the first step is to talk to your general health care provider, uh, your general doctor, um, talk to them about these signs. The other question is, I notice these signs, but my loved one isn't going to talk to the doctor. They're, nope, nope, it's not going to happen. And Dr. Hendricks probably has personal experience on this. Um, and so there's probably a lot of different things we can talk about. Maybe it's talking to the doctor ahead of time or the nurse team, letting them know what is going on, uh, slipping them a note, <laughs> writing a note down. So important when you start seeing signs and changes to write it down, write down those changes or ask other people, do you notice these changes too? And if you can talk to that individual, your loved one about these changes, that's great. If not, talk to the people around you, talk to the doctor. From there, the doctor will help you get a care team. We want a care team there. And maybe they'll refer on to uh, Dr. Hendricks or a neurologist or other um, healthcare professionals that can help you on this journey as well. So there's, there's a lot of us that can help find referrals in any city, state. Um, so you are surrounded by people in this room that can help daughters and sons and spouses get connected. And then Tifa often will, will say, you, know, you might ask, you know, ask the spouse, have you noticed changes? Absolutely. Um, actually, they have, what is that called, Dr. Henry, where the spouse will, hey, there's a test for that, but actually it's for the spouse or the care partner that says, have you noticed these changes in this person? Now I can't remember the name of it. There are several, but it's, several the, it's the other form. We have the, the spouse or the, the kids say, this is what I've seen now compared to before. Yes, and so it's so important because your input is so important because it, it might not just be memory, it might be sleep changes, it might be mood changes, other things that come with it. Um, the person sometimes kind of knows there's something different, but about 50% are not gonna acknowledge at all that there's any change because uh, they're smart. They, they might have dementia, but they're smart. So they don't want anybody to know um, that there have been changes because they don't want to go into a home particularly. So um, that's always a challenge, you know, but, uh, but spouse and, and child information are very important for sure. Let me say one thing about that. So maybe the A word was a no -signosia. Could be. Yes. So an important point uh, and this comes out with diagnosis, is a lot of individuals with cognitive decline do not know they have cognitive decline. And no is the clinical term, but basically with the changes in their brain, their insight is changing. And it looks to us as their loved ones like they're just being difficult, but they feel good. I always tell patients, this is the gift that you get with your disease it allows you to feel pretty good, right? You feel good most days and they'll go, yeah, I feel great. They're just picking on me. <laughs> well, that insight, if I have a cold and I go to work and I'm not feeling my best, insight tells me I'm not at my best that day. That person actually loses that ability. Now, it's a gift because they're not frustrated all day long. My traumatic brain injury patients who are young often have insight. And all day long, they are frustrated because they can't do things like they used to. They become depressed, suicidal. It's a whole different thing. Now, the challenge is for the family because the gift is for the patient because they feel good. But now they also do not see that there's a problem. So to them, they look at you, just leave me alone. Why are you picking on me? And the, the challenge is that there's no way to explain it differently that's going to make it money. Does that make sense? And that, that's often the challenge. You all see it as clear as day. We, have, we see it, but the patient doesn't see it. The individual doesn't see it. And that's challenging. 
Okay, so you can already see, it's like 11 o'clock. This is such a complex subject, and it's exactly why people need to ask questions and get connected with professionals. And don't just stop with the first professional you talk to. You should talk to many people. So successful aging is about positivity, adaptability, and resourcefulness. And it, this requires resourcefulness. This requires family members to make suggestions, to make phone calls, to gather information, to provide information, to get the daughters to ask questions. Um, so you're gathering lots of information so that you can figure things out as a family. Does everyone with dementia end up in a home? No, they don't. In fact, there's not even enough room for everyone if that were the case, because about is it about 50% of people over the age of 85 have some type of dementia? Yes. And about four out of five families fall apart during, during the dementia process. That's why the skills are so important. And we can't educate, teach you know, everything here. And the dementia mini series, I'm so glad that we're doing this. But guess what? In the six part, Mini series, we're not even going to be able to, to cover everything. We're just giving you some clues. One thing we talked about is isolation. And a lot of people, a lot of seniors, they don't want to go out like you guys are. They want to stay in their home and they'll stay in their home day after day after day. They're comfortable there. And what happens if you're comfortable and you stay in your home and you don't go out and visit with people and you don't go outside and hear the birds and you don't get out and see the sun? You could stay in your home and live, but your quality of life is going to be diminished and your brain is going to be diminished faster. And it's very important to get them out of the house and get yourself out of the house so you are making all those brain connections. So we're going to take a quick intermission and then we want to hear from, from everybody here and have you ask some questions with the time we have left. We have Rebecca Hegarty with Love Hope. Please don't leave. If you feel weird that we're going to turn some music on, just ignore us for a little while. But if you'll play with us, we appreciate it. This is a good time to take a break or let Rebecca lead us in some exercise, which is so important. Uh, everybody else, that's you, you all too. Y'all want to be mentors here today. So everybody get up. So important in life is that we keep moving. One of the preventions of memory loss is moving. So let's march it out here. So it's summertime, right? Summer's about to go. I know it's hot outside, but we can still move. Just turn on the music inside and pretend like you're outside, right? Props, pick it up. So my beautiful. Like you can. If you have somebody who lives in your house, so you can bounce the beats all around, right? It's all about having fun and getting moving, okay? All right, so step forward right here. So at Club Hope, we're all about functional living, staying healthy, doing exercise to keep our brain working. All right, cross it over. Anytime we cross over, our brain has to work a little differently. If you need a chair, that's what it's for. Keep going. So the other thing too is I'm gonna show you some things while you're moving. Take it to a heel right here. You can get a broomstick, you can get, you can be like cleaning and dance around, but shoulder flexibility is very important. I'm going to use a like community, someone is there, there are experts like that, that can help you out with this. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so I think you should be moving and moving and improving your balance. How do you feel after a little music and a little moving around? Tired. Think I feel energized? Yeah. Yes. It's working your brain, and you really can help make yourself better in many, many ways. So let's get back to our panel. When 
what can you add to our conversation this morning? But honey, you're just sitting there, and I know you could have done this whole thing by yourself. No, I think Leanne and I both learned a lot, so we appreciate um, the presentations and just again honored to be a part of this. Um, in the uh, the expert that did the video as we uh, began today, um, she talked about support, being sure to have um, a support system or that third leg of uh, serving and helping people with Alzheimer's and dementia. And that's what we are at Catholic Charities Adult Day Services. Uh, we're not only interested in providing great quality care for individuals who are trying to stay in their home and experiencing Alzheimer's and dementia, but we're here for the caregivers um, as well because it's important for the caregivers to stay healthy to be able to care for the individuals with Alzheimer's and dementia. And you need help, you need that respite, you need time um, to be able to take care of yourself. And so we're there to be able to take care of your loved one during the day um, so that you can practice self-care as well. The only thing I would add is, uh, as I was listening to a couple of the panelists up here, um, we are designed to be an option, and um, as you're thinking about what those next steps are, um, we want to be the, the source of support as you make some of those transitions. Um, many of our uh, participants that come to us, um, it's an opportunity for them to have some say and some choice in their decision of joining us, so there's some empowerment with that. Um, and I always encourage um, family members who are considering adult day services to actually bring their loved one with them so that they can actually see the environment and be part of the conversation because they, they do have something to contribute and it is their life. And so by allowing them to take a tour, to see what we have to offer, to see the fun that we have, um, and then give them the chance to have a seat at the table when we're having these conversations, it does really give them a sense of control. Yes. And that's exactly what we're all about, empowerment. So it's empowerment of each individual person and being in control of your own life. And if you're going to start a new habit, if you really are going to try something new, how long does it take for it to kick in? 21 days. 21 days, 30 days? You got an activity? You have an activity again? Okay. Okay, so I want everybody to go like this. Now look at which thumb's on top. I want you to switch around. Try to put the other thumb on top. How easy was that? Okay. Ping on like this. Try to go back and forth. All right. Is it better now? Or you can cheat like me and go like this. Right? To be able to switch back and forth, it's going to take me six to eight weeks. Six to eight weeks. So when Tico was talking about skill, she meant that when you're learning a new skill, it takes six to eight weeks, and that is uh, involving something in the brain, correct, Dr. Heinrich? Uh, because it helps to form synapses. <laughs> I am not Dr. Heinrich. <laughs> you caught me off guard. I was distracted. <laughs> Six to eight weeks. So, um, for example, the approach that Robert and I use, right? That's going to take six to eight weeks to get comfortable. Okay. Uh, Tifa taught me to kind of come to people and approach them to the side. And you'll see me in a facility doing this all the time because I just want to talk to people. So I'm coming. And then I go, you'll see me go like this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been, believe me, it's been 28 years. Okay. I'm, I'm having problems. But six to eight weeks, so if you're learning a new skill, a new approach, a new way to think, six to eight weeks, diet, exercise, sleep, and stress, six to eight weeks to get that down, okay? So if you're trying Club Hope or you're trying, trying adult daycare, you might say, would you do me a favor and try this for two months? Let's try it for two months because you're going to feel weird and awkward the first time, the second time, the third time, it takes a little while. That's one of the biggest questions that I hear from um, loved ones is how long do we give this um, if they're really unhappy or they come home and they're frustrated. 
Um, one of the things that we really encourage is that we, we, there's no contract with adult day services. Um, we really try and encourage people to give us at least 30 days. Um, our program is designed where you um, commit for two days per week. Um, and really two days is not a whole lot of time to really understand what we have to offer and what our program is designed for. So if you're only committing two days a week, I really encourage 60 days to really have that routine, that transition, and it is a transition. Um, and we work with every single individual family member on how that transition can work best for their individual that they're working with. Um, it, a person-centered plan is really important and our staff takes that very seriously. So when we're, when we're visiting with you to determine what are the best things for the individual that you're going to be working with, um, if you're part of that conversation, but so are they. And giving it a little bit of time um, and not making a snap decision on they're, they're frustrated, they're angry, this is hard, uh, but still being that, that support system while when they come home and listening to them, but then also checking in with us because we probably have a little bit different of a report to provide to you. And we can actually give you some pictures of how their day went and give you some ideas of the activities that they actually participated in. So what they might be sharing with you might be different than what actually happened throughout the day. So it sounds like you're providing respite for the caregiver, or we prefer, prefer to say care partner because there's lots of different people involved. And you know how there's always that one kid sometimes that ends up being the caregiver. If you think about being a care partner, the others are care partners too, maybe in their own way, but it's, it's a way of trying to make it a little more inclusive. Um, so respite, but also stimulation, and I imagine a lot of enrichment. Very good. Robert, you have something? Yeah, I'm going to talk about my social work right now. So as many of you are listening to all of us talk, and, and some of this sounds like, that's easy, I do that already, then why is it so complicated at home? Keep in mind, as you have thought about what we're giving you, you have all probably been thinking about someone specifically in your head, correct? Someone that you're thinking, hmm, this would have been helpful or is helpful, or I need to tell them, maybe that person is someone you're responsible for, maybe it's your spouse, and you're thinking about them, I now need you to switch their name to yours. You need to be thinking about you. When we make recommendations to go and utilize these services, the individual is going to have an adjustment period. You're still so protected, you're like, well, they didn't have a good time. So I'm not going to do that again. It was, it was too hard. You have to give these things a chance because it's as important that you do it for you as you do it for them. And if they had a bad day and you had a good day, that's still a success because you need that too. You know, these are these are all important resources because the plan is not for them, it's for both of you or the team to make sure that you can run this marathon and not just a race. It will wear you out. So I named this seminar Downsizing with Dementia because when we were planning it at the end of last year, we were thinking that perspective. And, and then it started to feel limiting to me in the last few days because there's so much I want to share with you about dementia and about all these things. And I just encourage you to get really curious and ask lots of questions, stay in curiosity. And just to address the downsizing part of it, no matter where someone is, there are realtors that specialize in senior um, senior real estate specialty, but there's not, there's not very many of us across the country. So sometimes we have to do a little research to figure out who the best people might be to make a referral. So we in Wichita, my husband and I, we do senior real estate. We have, offer all this education. We, all, we just offer something totally different because we're also offering all these resources. And then we have the senior new management. We can consult on decluttering and downsizing. We can consult on, you know, sometimes I, two people have already been there and said, get rid of the throw rugs. And then I, I will very plainly ask, why is the throw rug still there? So I, I can help with a lot of these things and then get you connected. And you can always call our main number, 686-4500, or go to our website for any of the topics that we cover and get the resources that you need. But let me assure you that no matter where someone is, 
it is vital that they don't just call a regular, let's say, real estate agent, because most real estate agents are after a transaction and they don't have any knowledge beyond that. And in fact, real estate is very complicated just in itself. So sometimes people get a realtor that will talk about putting the house on the market and throw just up into everything into complete chaos and say, you got to clean that, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to sell your house right now or something terrible is going to happen and, and just cause a lot of issues. So it's really important that anybody from any industry that you bring in is really going to be a helpful partner to the whole entire family and is going to protect the health and the mental condition of everyone involved. And just like they structure individual plans for everything, we do the same thing with what we do. And we plan everything to work out best for the family involved. And usually that involves, if someone's gonna make a move, usually we make the move first, we might figure out creative ways to do that. And then we start figuring out how to deal with the rest of the personal property in the house and getting the house closed and protecting that high dollar amount because usually the home is paid for or they have a lot of equity in it or maybe they don't maybe there's other issues to deal with so we help with all that to make everything as simple as can be so you can focus on the people that you really need to focus on and um, the activities that you really need to be doing and we can help make all that smooth in the background let's get a few questions in what questions do you have I'll run back and forth with the mic. Connie? I actually have two questions. First, is Alzheimer's or dementia, is it hereditary? And the second question is, are all these pills that are out on the market, like Nura and, and all the others, do they really help? Great question. So how big a role does genetics play and what can we do to make it better? So in terms of heritability, genetic stuff, the earlier onset diziseases tend to be more heritable, okay? So there's a form of Alzheimer's that I diagnosed as young as 39 years old. There you're pretty likely that it's genetically coded. Uh, a typical Alzheimer's after 65, not, not as much. Uh, in terms of and the same goes for all dementia. So frontotemporal, if it's if the person's 50 when I'm diagnosing them, it's more likely to be heritable versus if they're 75. So that's kind of a rule of thumb. Medications. So there are a number of medications like Uricept and Avinda, and then combinations of those. In the research, if an individual has Alzheimer's disease, not something else, but Alzheimer's disease, in some folks, not everybody, some folks, if they were declining like this, it let them stay independent a little bit longer. Did it work for everybody? No. Did it improve cognition? No. That's been one of the challenges. We don't know if it helped or not. So those medications, your providers tend to say, all right, if you can take them, it's not a cost problem and you don't have side effects, we'll just stay on them in case they're helping. The new one that's come out is very similar. Um, there are some studies that have shown some improvement. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. That have shown that some individuals are staying the same, maybe longer. And if that's the case for, for the person you love, that may be worthwhile. The cost is incredibly high, and insurance does not want to pay for the new one. It's thousands of dollars a month, and it's an infusion. So you got to have an IV, and it's like once a month or something. Yeah. What so. about the over the counter then? Like supplements? Right. So uh, there haven't been any supplements that have been shown in a disease like Alzheimer's or frontotemporal to make a reliable difference. However, how do we test a medication? We have the, a group get the medication and a group get the placebo effect. Because giving a placebo, a sugar pill, sometimes we feel better. <laughs> now, it, yes, it's sugar, but I'm doing something. I feel more active. And so the placebo effect is an effect. I certainly would not go out and spend a whole bunch of money because there's not some wonder pill like that out there. 
But if you want to try something and just see if it makes a difference, and your primary care doc says it's fine, there's no harm in that. One more thing I will say, because I'm seeing doctors get into this, and it's it's uh, I get on my pulpit about this periodically. There, there are a lot of folks who are aging now, and there's a lot of money to be made. Okay, there is no particular pill or cognitive program that will fix your brain. Now, having said that, if I give you the same uh, task and you do it over and over, you're gonna get better at it. And you should, you're practicing. But if I take you now and I test your memory, let's say it's a memory test, your memory won't be any better, okay? You're simply practicing and getting better at that task. So the point of this is, if somebody wants you to pay 50 bucks a month to come to their place and do their games, it is not worth it. But it is worth it to be cognitively active, uh, to do activities, to be outside of the home, to read, to do puzzles, to paint, to color. But those are all not expensive. So I did want to say a little about that. Great. And then Fiona mentioned DESS, diet, exercise, stress, and sleep. So if you're getting some big clues, and I, we could do a seminar on each of these individual topics. All right, so what is this stuff up here? So when it comes to diagnosing dementia or, or um, figuring out what kind of state someone is in, there's a medical model called Well, there is Dr. Reisberg's clinical deterioration scale. I think we use more for diagnosing and, and maybe reimbursement and kind of getting the medical model probably we have right, Dr. Ford. I don't, I don't use it, but I'm also diagnosing. I'm not seeing them at the later stage. Right, right. right. So in care, I'm going to be honest with you. In, when I'm working as a clinician, I'm not particularly interested in what kind of dementia they have. Okay, and I'm really not interested in what they can't do. Um, you know, that's more for reimbursement and, and that sort of thing. I'm interested in what they can do because it's the only thing I can utilize. Okay, so Tifa Snow came up. She's an occupational therapist. They are the SpongeBob's of the world. They are all eternal optimists. Okay, so they uh, look at what you have that you can work with. And so she came up with this thing called the GEMS. And so do you want me to explain the gems? Just very quickly. Yes. So if we're normal, okay, we're, I never have been, um, we're sapphires. So we're, we're chugging right along. We're doing very well. We don't have really any kind of memory problem. We might get a little upset if they cancel our flight, right? Okay. <laughs> then our amygdala gets a little stimulated. Diamonds might be a mild stage of dementia or... I might be a diamond if somebody gets my order wrong or my flight gets canceled, those kind of things. I would turn into a diamond. Diamonds are clear and sharp and inflexible, right? But sometimes you'll see that before you'll actually see a dementia diagnosis, people will start to get, I'll give you an example. Um, get me some mayonnaise. Get me the one with the blue and the white label, right? You come up with crap and they're like, that's not real mayonnaise. Well, it says real mayonnaise on the label. No, they want helmets. So very inflexible. We can't really describe it. Okay. That might be a diamond. Now that diamonds can cut, they can shine. Yes, they can cut, but they can shine, right? They they can uh, go there. A lot of times there's a big diamond in the middle and they have all these little lemons around them. Okay. Uh, they're kind of levers too. So emeralds, you're talking about really mild, getting into a little bit more of a cognitive problem there with emeralds, you're starting to notice a difference, okay? They can hide it, right? Unless they go see Dr. Heinrich, they can hide it. Um, but a lot of times families will go, she was, you know, she, she asked me that already today, and she already told me that story. Amber's, uh, you're starting to get into more of what we would call maybe some actions or behavior, I hate that word, but it describes it better, um, that may be a little bit more difficult, okay? Walking out of the house into 110 degree heat with your coat on, um, getting turned around. I can literally, as an amber, drive three hours and think I went 10 minutes. There's a loss of awareness of time. 
Um, they're really on the go. They're the most difficult to actually take care of as care partners. Roomies, you're talking about somebody who's having a little bit more difficulty talking and receiving uh, information as well. Uh, it's, it's striking at this point. And at this point, you know something's going on. They can't hide it. It's there. And uh, but you can have some really beautiful moments with rubies. Pearl are in stage. So once you go like this, put your hands together. Tifa describes a pearl. It's my favorite stage actually because I'm a nurse. So if you look at the outside of an oyster, it's the most ugly thing you'll ever see in your life. Truly, right? They're very difficult to take care of. You get a lot of yelling a lot of contractures, not much verbalization, and you feel like they're uncomfortable a lot of the time. Open it up just a little bit. Just for a second, you get this glimpse of a pearl, the most beautiful gem of all. And you can have beautiful moments with these folks, and they are there. I'm gonna give you an example of this. I have a little lady named Anne, and our thing was, I met her when she was an emerald, and our thing was, she would say, see you later, alligator. And I would say, <laughs> every single time. The next time I saw Ann after seeing her as a home health nurse was probably about a year later. I walked up, so glad to see her. She is down in her wheelchair like this. She's not interacting with anybody. There's a group going on. Okay? And I got down into supportive stance. And I got that eye contact after doing hand under hand, gave her a little hand pump. And she looked at me and I said, see you later, alligator. And she literally, we had a moment. Did she know who I was? Maybe, maybe not, didn't matter. We had a moment, but the staff said she hasn't interacted with anybody in months, right? But the fact was I used something familiar that she thought was funny and I used a positive physical approach. And I was able to make that connection with Ann. I don't know if it did anything for her, but it did a heck of a lot for me, right? You can still have those moments and it looks ugly at the end of this disease. But I gotta be honest with you, not a lot of us look pretty at 110, right? So um, the, the, those are the gem stages. And the beautiful thing about the card that uh, Catherine is holding is it describes all those gem stages and how you can positively support somebody with this disease despite what diagnosis it is, okay? The other thing I wanna mention about it is I can be a diamond in the morning and I might be all the way up to an amber in the evening because I might have a little sundowning, but the interventions are corresponding with whatever you're seeing, right? So it's helpful to care partners. So there's a lot to learn that is extremely beneficial. So get diagnosed early because there's there's things that can be made better. Um, there's a lot of tools and skills available uh, to make things better. And one thing I might add about rubies and pearls is that Tifa said that sometimes for family, maybe that's when you just become family rather than being the care providers because it actually can for some people, not be healthy to maybe spend more than 15, 20 minutes uh, a day with that person because they don't want you to just see the, the dementia. They want you to see who they are as your mother and to, you hate the dementia and sometimes it can look like you hate me and um, to limit the time. And, and that's when you're really gonna need some, some help. Okay, there are a couple more questions. I've got a question back here. This is some very good information, but years ago, I used to visit the hospital and I was shocked at the number of caregivers in the hospital. And one of the caregivers told me, he said, 50% of the time, we die before the person we're taking care of dies. So this is very good information, but I'm wondering if there might be a series for caregivers too, because that to me, I mean, I was shocked by that. I've never heard of that before. It might even be higher than that. How often does the caregiver uh, not outlive the patient? So you have a spouse taking care of another spouse or and then a boomer child taking care
care of a, a parent and they may not outlive the person they're caring for how often that's a great question i don't know the statistic off the top of my head but i do know it is pretty high um it's high on caregiver stress caregiver burnout uh, and what we tell caregivers so important you have to put your oxygen mask on before you help your loved one so making sure you're taking care of yourself that's why there's great resources up here for you that are here to walk the journey it is so important like we said each and every one of us uh, to build that care team and have more people on your team that is going to help um, especially in that caregiver stress it is so hard this is a heart disease it's a lung disease it is but you do have resources um each and every one of us on the stage is a resource for you and here to help uh but yes that is unfortunately a statistic um but there are resources and it's okay to ask for help and i just want to say that you know one when you get to this stage that's where you may not feel or you feel like you're breaking a promise uh, either place someone for care. So that's where that plan B we talked about is important for you to be exploring before the crisis moment happens. And also kind of think about the fact that, and, and I do a talk on care manager or caregiver to care manager. Most of us start when we're physically caring for a loved one and we're doing a lot for them and we can't sustain that alone. When you become a care manager of the person you love, you are now promoted. And that means you are now learning to utilize the resources that you have to meet the same objective that you cannot do alone. So think about that, caregiver to care manager. And I have put the when is it time checklist that we often use as a conversation for family in the back. And we're glad to visit with you about what plan B can be like, even though it's a scary thing to face sometimes. Okay, we get this question here, and then we'll get a photo with the panel, and then we will conclude. Uh, can someone run my run it to the end? We are talking about solo aging. So maybe you become widowed, or you don't have children, or you know someone in that position. So next month we're talking about solo aging, how to cope and help others. Well, maybe you just feel alone. And so we're going to talk about that. Well, I'm a very new widow. My husband had a bone marrow uh, disease for five years. I was his caregiver. I found good support and good comfort and good information on an inline support group called smartpatients.com. And that's where I first heard about Tina Snow, although she never had dementia, but uh, there's a lot of good support there. Thank you very much. And tifasnow.com, uh, there's a lot of great resources there, and there's videos to watch. Okay, so I know you have more questions, so feel free to come around and visit with all of the different people that uh, you're interested in. We have a group from Parkinson's Connect, Club Parkinson's. Um, they're going to do the Nordic pole walking outside. They're awesome to talk to. And home health and, and hospice back here, the legal um, healthcare resort of Wichita, Bree. And Justin uh, Roshlu, JR Mortgage. He sponsored our amazing luxury bus tour. We had so much fun. We'll do it again in, in the fall. And he can help people do um, a, a, what is it called? It's a uh, equity mortgage, home equity conversion mortgage. With, it's the new kind of reverse mortgage. And so we've talked about that a little bit, but that's a way maybe to unlock some funds to help pay for things perhaps or to move out of a home that no longer is the right environment and maybe move into something that's a better environment where you can age in place longer. So, all right, and Delno, our photographer, could you get a photo of our panel and then we'll break and then go get the people you're interested in talking to and ask some questions. Okay, Delno.
Thank you. If you ever need a photographer, Delta is awesome too, by the way. Thank you so much for being here. And since you're here in the comments, I don't think you'll think about going out looking at the flowers. We're so glad that you come to enjoy the seasons with us all year. Thanks so much.